I want to say, this is beyond the dream. They're one of the most controversial metal bands of all time. Loved by many, hated by few. But nobody could deny the legacy they left behind and the path they skulked through the metal terrain, leading the way for bands like Lamb of God. Of course, I'm talking about the Texas powerhouse, Pantera. Even though Pantera was always seen as a newer band during their heyday in the 90s, they actually formed in 1981 when the Abbott brothers Benny Paul and Dimebag Darrell, who was then going by the name Diamond Darrell, were still teenagers in high school. The dog with them were bassist Rex Walker, better known as Rex Brown, and vocalist Terry Glaze. Terry Lee, lead vocal, mom! The sound Pantera had then was far away what they would be known for later on, being that they were a full-on glam band and had released four albums in the 80s. Now when the band's first major label release, Cowboys from Hell, came out in 1990, they would go out of their way to erase these albums from their discography. But while even being glam, these albums had some decent material and showed what a guitar virtuoso Dimebag was even then. Yeah. Yeah. Metal Magic is Pantera's unofficial debut album and was the first of four albums released on their independent label by the same name, which was managed by their dad Joey Abbott. And since the members of Pantera were around 16 to 19 years old at this time and were massive KISS fans, this album is ingrained with the KISS influence. From the references to Walking Out, to the opening bass line to Ride My Rocket, which was pulled straight from Detroit Rock City, and also said Love sounds eerily similar to Kiss's Strange Ways. Even though I do like half of the songs on this album, especially the tracks Biggest Part of Me and Widowmaker, Metal Magic comes off as amateurish. And what's going on with this tacky cover art? One of the Thundercats walking a flimsy ass sword that looks like it would break if it was hit by a gust of wind. But what it is, Metal Magic stands as a good grand metal party album. Nothing more, nothing less. In my opinion, Projects in the Jungle is a better album even though it managed to have a worse album cover. Seriously, what the fuck am I looking at? A fifth grader could pencil in a better cover. Holy shit. Musically, the band still haven't come into their own yet and were at this time fully immersed in the Van Halen Death Leopard worship with single Terry Glaze trying his damnedest to sound like Joe Elliott on Pyromania. But in their defense, at least they sound like Death Leopard with balls. For a glam album, Projects in the Jungle is pretty aggressive, with the prominent double bass drums and Dimebag's faster picking style, kind of like Van Halen if Van Halen actually played metal. And it holds up well compared to more established LA bands like Stripal. The songs that are really good on here are In Over My Head and Only A Heartbeat Away. I also like taking my life a little bit too. Projects in the Jungle works well on its own, but like Metal Magic, you just can't compare it to the later stuff. This is the heaviest of the three albums with Terry Glaze, and although it's still in the sphere of glam metal, you can start to hear the thrash influence creep in, with the faster chord progressions, and you also start hearing the signature Dimebag guitar squeal as he began developing his own playing style. Terry Glaze's vocal is also a little more flexible and he doesn't come off as such a carbon copy glam single. I Am The Night still has its shell of 80's glam trite, i.e. Forever Tonight, 
but it also has some of the best bangles of the Graham Taylor era, such as Down Below, which was so good they recorded it again on their next album, Power Metal, Right on the Edge, and my personal favorite, Come On Eyes. This would be the final album with vocalist Terry Glaze, who would exit the band due to a class of personalities and wanted to pursue a different musical direction. And Pantera would bring in New Orleans native Bill Anselmo. The three albums with Terry Glaze do have a cult following, and some would even say that they were the best thing Pantera have done, but I'd have to say that's a bridge too far. But still, Buy them if you can find them. Shortly after Phil Anselmo joined Pantera, their sound began to change drastically, with Anselmo being more influenced by extreme acts like Venom, Slayer, and Celtic Frost. He also had a different singing approach, using a more guttural screaming style, and on top of that, Dimebag started playing in a more rapid fire progression with thrashier riffs. Power metal isn't necessarily power metal, but it damn sure isn't glam either. Having a more traditional sound, with Phil Anselmo sounding like a cross between Rob Halford and Jeff Tate. Power metal is the pinnacle of the pre-Cowboys era, an underrated jam that doesn't get anywhere near the recognition it deserves. I mean, what can you say about an album that even the band's detractors applaud? If you haven't heard this album before, you're guaranteed to have this motherfucker on repeat. If not, I seriously question your musical taste buds. However, the track Will Meet Again is weak by Anselmo's standards. Death Trap and Hard Ride are great songs. But the one that soars above the rest is over and out. Which showed that Pantera were already building up to a new sound. And it was around this time that Dimebag Devil was a cut hair away from joining Megadeth. The only thing that prevented him from doing so was the fact Vinny Paul couldn't come along with him. But I think that worked out better for both bands, with Megadeth seizing the comparable Marty Friedman and Pantera carrying on, as we are about to see. <laughs> Just before, Pantera was set to record their major label debut, Cowboys From Hell. They were still being criticized and their name dragged in the mud for their glam metal past, being labeled posers by other bands, and they were being torn down and talked shit on by close to 30 different record companies. People can dig up our past, people can dig up our in-between careers, and it doesn't make a difference. We never consciously set out to be the heaviest band in, in the world that's commercially acceptable. We just wrote songs. That, along with the face and decline of Meadows' popularity with the onset of the 90s. Yet, when the time came to record the album, Pantera wore a well-oiled machine, ready to go into battle. On Cowboys From Hell, Pantera teamed up with acclaimed producer Terry Day, who produced albums for a variety of bands, from Metal Church to Soundgarden. And this would begin a relationship that would last almost a decade. Uh, Rex and I are still good friends, and we, we talk pretty regularly. Terry Dade helped the band achieve a clearer, more pristine production quality, which was sorely missing from their independent releases. With this, Pantera introduced their reinvented look and sound, combining the ZZ Top Texas-style groove with a crunchy thrust tone and Dimebag's notorious pinch harmonics, promulgating the groove metal sound. However, there has been some discussion over the years that Pantera supposedly ripped off their sound from a New Orleans band by the name of Exodo, who Phil Anselmo had known and who had demos out as early as 1987, 
before their album Slaughter in the Vatican dropped in 1990. Kyle Thomas is an original. He is entirely original. I love Phil. I worked with Phil and I enjoyed working with Phil. Phil is, at his best, is imitating Kyle. I can see similarities as far as the guitar tones and some of Phil's vocals, but Phil was still singing in a higher pitch on Cowboys from Hell instead of the lower death growl he would do later on as he adapted a more hardcore punk singing style in the vein of like Black Flag. And also if you really listen to Slaughter in the Vatican, you'll find it's a standard thrash album without any groove inclinations and to be honest, I don't think Exhorter were destined for much mainstream success with an album titled Slotto in the Fucking Vatican. Besides, Cowboys from Hell was a little removed from Thrash with its drops and sudden tempo changes like on the mainstay title track as well as the dominating Domination. <laughs> Everything on here is pretty straightforward and Dimebag hits every note down like a hammer, especially on tracks like The Art of Shredding and The Thick as Hell Primal Concrete Sledge. Also Phil displayed a crazy wide vocal range, which you can hear on tracks like Cemetery Gates and Medicine Man, a range that he would never be able to duplicate by the way. Cowboys from Hell is a barn burner of an album, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that it changed the metal landscape overnight, with some of the old guard changing their sound and becoming more urban. Skid Row dropped the whole glam act and became a lot more heavy on their Slave to the Grind album, and Rob Halford quit Judas Priest and formed the glorified Pantera tribute, Fight. No doubt, Cowboys from Hell left its mark and provided a launching pad for bands like Machine Head and Prong. But it was only the beginning of the groove metal onslaught. One, two, three, four! Out of the gates, Vulgar Display of Power makes itself known and is relentless in its sonic brutality. It is, as evident by the cover art of some guy getting slugged in the face, a slobber knocker. It takes everything that Cowboys from Hell achieves and puts it on steroids and adds in a hardcore feel. I mean fuck, it software sampled five songs off this badass album for Doom. Vulgar display of power was groundbreaking for its time, with the band not afraid to take on some hard-hitting subjects like violence, alienation, and themes of Satanism such as in the song by Demons Be Driven. Phil also addresses race relations in the US on wise and no good attack the radical, and this was at the cusp of the LA riots in 92. These songs are about not falling into prejudices and being more open and not having a closed mind. But mixed with all that is Dimebag's ominous technical guitar work that comprises this whole album. I can't single out any song on Vogel and I know if I did I'd be crucified, but I do have an affinity for Mouthful Wall and the raw energy of fucking Hostile. The most notable track on here though, which is the third track, Walk, is a tad bit overweighted, but I will say that it exemplifies Dimebag's style and ability to turn two notes into a medicine anthem for telling haters to fuck off. Vogel display of power still sounds up to date, and I would dare say is a touchstone of the band's discography, even more so than the previous album. If you need to own one Pantera album, it's this one. During this time, Pantera for better or for worse became the flag bearers for metal after the grunge craze of the early 90s 
caused many larger metal bands to go to the wayside or change their sound completely. And while Metallica was selling their souls for mainstream radio play, Pantera decided to go all out, the heavier the better. After reaching the mountaintop with the release of Vulgar Display of Power, the question arose on exactly how far Pantera were willing to go, and the answer was far beyond driven. This album contains aggressive riffs, angry vocals, skull pounded drums, and pent up frustration wrapped into one package, and it has more grooves than a vinyl. Believe it or not, it was around this time that Daryl dropped the Diamond pseudonym and adopted the name Dimebag Daryl. He also used a thicker, down tuned tone on this album that chugs along as Phil Anselmo screams about everything from back pain to daddy issues. There's an angry feel to it because we play aggressive, heavy music, right. but, but I think personally, as a whole, on the record, there's some songs that are about specific things, and then other songs, like within one song, they, they, it, it, it covers a whole range of different, different things, you know? So I, it's, it's hard for me to pinpoint on what I'm exactly writing about, uh, in an angry way about, you yeah, know? I think, so, I think what he's saying is a lot of it's left open to your own interpretation. However, Far Beyond Driven does come off as kind of one-dimensional at times, especially on the second half of the album, with many of the songs just blending together until it comes to the Black Sabbath cover at the end, Planet Killer Band. A lot of the more notable tracks like Five Minutes Alone and I'm Broken are rolled out on the beginning of the album, but the second part of the album does have some brutally heavy songs, such as Use My Third Arm, and a lot of those songs feature Dimebag putting on a guitar clinic with all the crazy effects he's able to add in. But I have to ask, what in the nine flaming circles of fucked up hell is up with good friends in a bottle of pills? We'll put in some next level shit with this. Unexpectedly, Fall Beyond Driven shot up to number one on the charts, much to the dismay of the band, particularly Phil Anselmo, who is in no condition to support a number one album on tour, thanks to a well-documented back injury he suffered on stage, in which he was resorting to alcohol and painkillers to be able to perform, eventually switched over to heroin. I knew in my heart that the uh, the injury wasn't going to get any better with uh, a number one record and touring upon touring upon touring. This of course had the effect of putting a band-aid over a gaping wound, but the band were going to push forward, come hell or high water. Much like the previous album, the Great Southern Trend Kill features fast, heavily down-tuned riffs, but with breaks and slower intervals, and Phil's vocals are more layered as he screams his guts out. But there's no getting around the fact that it is pretty much a clusterfuck with the overriding theme of going against our trends and staying true to their craft. The Great Southern Trend Kill was the beginning of the rift between the Abbott Brothers and Phil Anselmo, mostly caused by Phil's drug and alcohol problems and him always being high off his ass on heroin during live shows, sometimes having to perform whole shows while sitting or laying down. And when they were recording the album, Phil wasn't even in the same state, choosing to record the vocals at Trent Reznor's studio in New Orleans, while the rest of the band were recording in Texas. I sang my vocal tracks at the Nine Inch Nails studio also, and they were great to us. But with all that considered, this is the darkest and most abrasive Pantera album, with songs like Warner and Suicide Note Part 2. It doesn't hold back, it has an unyielding fuck the world attitude. This album often gets looked at as not measuring up to the rest of their output, and believe me, there was some utter garbage on here. 
but if you dig into it, you'll find some solid gems like Drag the Waters. Drag the Waters some more, like never before. Just consider the Great Southern Trend Kill as a band responding to being in a bad moment. Would I rank it up with other albums? No, but I wouldn't toss it out either. Tensions were still building up in the band after the release of the Great Southern Trend Kill, with Anselmo's drug overdose and his various douchebag antics on stage. I overdosed and killed myself for about four minutes, and um, I think it shook everybody else up. I was in bliss, actually. I was gone. Don't remember anything. And um, when you come out of something like that and you wake up and you just, you a, embarrassed. B, you see how it affects everybody around you. Just those two elements right there. No, there's no way that could ever happen again. But fortunately, Anselmo was able to get over his drug problems and get on the right track with the rest of the band, and they would put out this beast of an album. Reinventing the Steel drops the Fox Death Metal bullshit and goes back to a more groove-oriented sound with shoutouts to Black Sabbath and Slayer throughout. Kerry King even plays the outro on Goddamn Electric. This was the first major album Pantera had produced on their own, and it soars above the trash of the early 2000s. The songs are a lot more technical and melodic, which was much needed after the downturn drudgery of the previous album. And it was clear that Pantera was trying to do something redefining. From front to back, every track is great and stands out in their own right. Tracks like Revolution Is My Name and The Strong Real Yesterday Don't Mean Shit. Also really like Uplift, especially Dimebag's elevating guitar playing on that song, which will make you want to walk through Hellfire. The most telling, while the band acknowledges their influences, they also recognize their own influence on the genre with Outcast the Shadow. In hindsight, reinventing the steel served as a farewell from the band who helped keep metal alive in the alternative dominated 90s. Pantera was still marred by personal conflicts, and a little over a year after reinventing the Steel's release, they would play their last ever show in Japan, subsequently disbanding soon after. In the waning years, Phil Anselmo would put Pantera on the back burner, putting all of his focus on his 50 different side projects, and when calls to reform the band were falling on deaf ears, and after some verbal back and forth in the press, Dimebag and Vinnie Paul formed Diamond's Plan with single Patrick Lakeman. Uh, dude, it was something that uh, we never thought would happen. You know, we figured we'd be the Rolling Stones of heavy metal forever. And uh, when it all started going down, it was really unexpected. And uh, we did our very best from our side of the fence to rectify things uh, with conference calls. We had a meeting scheduled, all kinds of other things that never happened. And really, uh, hindsight, what it boils down to is Phil had a different agenda. He had other things he wanted to do and didn't want to let us know about it. So. Uh, once we finally came to the realization that the band was over, me and Dom decided to start writing music, pick up the pieces, kick some ass. We hooked up with Mr. Lockman over here who brought a whole new life to the thing. There were a lot of people who were just happy that the FOMO Pantera members were putting out new music. But there was the diehard Pantera fans that couldn't get over the fact that the band were done. Among those was a fuckhead by the name of Nathan Gale, a FOMO fan with a history of mental problems, who at one point thought the band were using telekinesis to steal lyrics from his mind. And on one random day, in one random city, Nathan Gale walked into a small club show where Damage Plan were playing and gunned down Dimebag Devil, who died on stage at just 38 years old. 
five people dead from a shooting at the Al Rosa Villa nightclub at 5055 Sinclair Road in North Columbus. Those killed include Daryl Dimebag Abbott, the guitarist for the group Damage Plan. A Columbus police officer shot and killed the gunman, 25-year-old Nathan Gale of Marysville, who witnesses say was holding a hostage in a headlock at the time. Authorities still do not know why Gale went on the rampage. Police have Nathan Gale also killed three other people and injured three more before being shot dead. It appeared that he was about to kill his hostage uh, when the officer uh, basically put an end to it. This was a massive blow to fans and fellow musicians alike who came out in droves to pay their respects at Dimebag Dale's funeral, including his idols Ace Freely and Eddie Van Halen. But noticeably missing from the funeral was Phil Anselmo, who was banned from attending and was being blamed for the breakup of Pantera. Phil would deny this, blaming the latte drinking heavy metal press, but him and Vinnie Paul were not on speaking terms, and it would be this way until Vinnie Paul's death in 2018, ending any chance of a Pantera reunion with the surviving members. And the conversation went something to the effect that my day's coming. And my rebuttal is Vince. All of our day is coming, bro. And if my day happens to end earlier than your day, does that change anything? Will that change anything or will you lose another brother? I'll be honest with you right now, I need Vinnie Paul real bad. Even though their ending was abrupt and unceremonious, it doesn't take away from the impact that Pantera had. Going from being an obscure glam band in the 80s to being probably the most important band of the genre in the 90s, and always remaining true to themselves. That will do it for this retro doc, and I will see you next time.